Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, David, become our speaker today. And today, David will present us about how to start your XR career. And David will have a great presentation for today. Okay, so I will pass the baton to David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Don. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, my name is David Syme. I'm, uh, I, uh, what am I? I've been in communications for about maybe 23 years, everything from uh, marketing through to uh, education. For a while there, I was a lecturer in further education. Um, and uh, as time went on, as I got involved, uh, basically we're talking like the late 90s when the internet was this new snazzy thing. And, uh, and I realized that from a marketing perspective, it enabled uh, anybody to access a global audience, which at that point was, um, unknown, unheard of, right? Multinational corporations were the likes of Coca-Cola and McDonald's. They weren't people working from their bedrooms, right? So I really like that. But the thing about marketing is, <clears throat> yes, it's about promotion. Yes, it's about communication. But when you think about communication and our sensory apparatus, we've got two of these, we've got two of these, and we've only got one of these. We should use them in that proportion. And that's what we learn in marketing is 70% research and tops about 30% Telling people stuff, you know, if they're lucky. Now, the good thing about the internet I found was it gave me masses of access to free, granular, very detailed information on everybody so that I could tailor the messages to people. But marketing itself is a bit of a dark art. So I ended up trying to apply that psychology and sociology to something a little bit more productive. So I started using it in healthcare and in education, got myself qualifications as further education lecturer. And uh, what I noticed over this time was that the communications online were going from heavily text-based. Yeah, you had slow connections, so you could download a lot of text and that was fine. Uh, and you, you you had a lot of, of detail to progressively, as connections got faster, more image-based stuff. Now, that's great because a picture speaks a thousand words and people really seem to have quite low attention spans online, you know, a few minutes, which seemed like not very much to me at the time. So we got into image-based communication and marketing and education and so forth, at which point I got picked up by uh, Google and the Chartered Institute of Marketing and people like that to, to inform them on, on, on how they should do it. And uh, then as time went on, even a picture wasn't enough and people were losing attention. So we're getting into video. So I started a company called Encore Video, online corporate video production, which was again more about research. Where are you going to put this video? What social media channels? For what version? For what audience? Uh, what time of day? You know, what length of, of, of staying power are you going to have? Which was fine. But even then, people's attention spans were getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I thought, there's, there's not really a market for people like me making big, shiny uh, video presentations. Because, you know, it's a little bit like the analogy of if you get two pieces of mail coming through your door, and one of them is uh, a shiny, thick, double-sided color glossy flyer and the other one is a slightly raggedy envelope with a hand, hand address you know address on it and, and a second class stamp which is the one that you open and which is the one that goes straight in the bin exactly i was making the one that goes straight in the bin <laughs> and the ones that were working were the ones that people were creating with their mobile phones right in five minutes and sticking up on social media so i got out of that one and i thought okay well we've gone from text to image to video What's the next logical step? And the next logical step, given that I had a background in psychophysiology and, you know, that kind of thing, and um, sort of biology of psychology, was something immersive. You know, what did we evolve for? Or depending on your religious leanings, what were we intelligently designed for? We were designed to use all of our sensory apparatus, spatial, auditory, visual. We were designed to communicate with each other in a non-linear fashion, responding to things as they happen, rather than having to sit and watch a video from beginning to the end, which if any of you have ever tried to use a video to instruct you on how to fix your car or build a flat pack, you'll know isn't a particularly good way of doing it. We're designed for communication. 
So I thought, okay, well, what technology will deliver that? And then the answer was staring me in the face. It was virtual reality because virtual reality allows you to be immersed in the space. It allows multiple people to communicate with each other simultaneously. It breaks down the distance barriers in the same way that the uh, the internet originally did so that you can be being shown how to, I don't know, build a motorcycle by somebody in Australia when you're in Johannesburg and your friends in, your friends in Tanzania and you're all learning together without the distance barriers. But you're also getting to learn from that social learning, experiential, kinesthetic, the whole movement thing, and, and visual and audio at the same time. So I got into that, changed the name of Encore Video to Encore Realities, and the rest is history. It turned out to be a really, really good move. Um, since then, I've started working with uh, more industry. So we have a company called Riot Digital now. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but it's more using these solutions for industrial and employment and, uh, and educational solutions rather than the commercial stuff that I used to do. Right, so that's my long rambling preamble. That's who I am. I will be talking, obviously, for the next little while, but as a teacher, as a lecturer, I know that that's a really bad way to teach. So I want you to feel free to interrupt. Now, you may, Dom, I don't know how you generally uh, handle these things, but maybe people want to add questions in on the chat, perhaps, and then you can uh, pass them through to me. Maybe you want to unmute them so that they can ask me directly. I don't mind. Feel free to interrupt. It makes things more interesting, <laughs> more engaging. And if I don't know the answer, I absolutely assure you that I will not pretend I do. I'll go away and find out. And then I'll come back to you with the answer later on. Because the worst thing is being given false information by somebody who refuses to admit that they don't know. Hopefully I know most of it. So I'll start sharing now. Uh, are we all okay? Is everything looking okay, Dom? Am I good to go? Awesome. Uh, all right. And just make sure that I've got my sound on. Optimize for video. Okay, we're good. And all right. Okay. Just go back. Right, Dom, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Are we still getting that weird little gray thing coming up that you were seeing earlier on? It still has it, but uh, it's not covering up your title. No worries. Well, I it probably will cover up some titles later on, so I'll just read them out as we go, just so that everybody knows what this what the page is about. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So I'll try and skip past the marketing bit, but this is my company, Riot Digital. I've got two other uh, co-directors, specialists in various different a a a elements of industry. So it's kind of stands for Realities and IoT. So it's a combination of augmented and virtual reality and things like Internet of Things, sensors, trackers internet connected devices everything from mobile phones to satellite dishes um, and we again work heavily with uh, digital transformation in industry education medicine and so forth we <clears throat> yeah, right there's this is a this is a key to this industry nobody knows everything and you can't know everything because it's moving so incredibly fast that the only way to do it is to find good partners and to continue to find good partners because for every problem somebody has come up with the solution out there there is no point reinventing wheels by all means come up with solutions yourself but don't first of all look to see whether somebody else has already done it there's also more than enough work out there and i mean more than more than enough work there's no sense in competing in this industry only collaborating and you usually find that whatever you're asked no matter how challenging you can draw together a team of intelligence clever, clever people like the ones on this screen here they will work with you and you will be able to provide the solution to the client we are part of the Metaverse Standards Forum, <clears throat> bit of a talking shop, but the one that I'm most interested, that's us in the middle, <clears throat> under IKEA and Meta. Um, however, the one that I really like is XRSI, which is the Extended Reality Standards Institute, um, or whatever it's called this week, sorry. <clears throat> that's a really good one for making sure that people are being looked after in the future. Now, the market for virtual reality is rapidly, rapidly growing, okay? Now, the reason for that is well, COVID had a big part of it, but also the technology has got lighter and cheaper and the competition has become much higher. So to be able to access virtual and augmented reality instead of requiring thousands of pounds worth of expensive equipment that only a minority of people had, you can pretty much get going with your own mobile phone or something that costs about three or four hundred pounds so it's becoming a lot more consumer ready and particularly in industries 
Also, the internet connectivity required has got faster and faster, which means that you don't necessarily have to download a whole bunch of things onto your device to make it work. You can just go online, follow a link and make it happen. We're gonna actually do a retest of that later on during this presentation. So live present, live tests and, and you guys, you know, using things, that's always a recipe for disaster, but I think this should work quite well. Now, I am going to be talking quite a lot about education because, yes, there's a lot of adoption in this uh, of this industry, but it's still relatively nascent. And by nascent, I mean it's early stages. And what people, what puts people off, going back to my marketing hat, is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If people don't understand things, they tend to be a bit fearful of them, and they're a bit dubious about using them in their industry. So the way that they almost always get started is using it for education. Because if you're want, considering using uh, vir virtual reality for, for instance, uh, controlling a robotic surgeon halfway around the world, there's loads that can go wrong there. But largely speaking, the same technology can be applied to training surgeons halfway across the world, you know, on virtual patients, less risk. So therefore, the, uh, the end user, the surgeons or the hospital get to try the technology, familiarize themselves with it, even ask for things to be fixed and bug fix. The developers get to be familiar, familiarized with the challenges of the client. If nobody's in danger, and then about a year or two later, once all the bugs have been ironed out, they will come back and say, you know what, I think we're ready to actually use this, excuse the pun, operationally. We were going to use this in the field now, and that's because they are confident in it. Their fear is gone, their uncertainty is gone, their doubt is gone, and the thing is ready for purpose. So education is a big deal for this, and I will go back to it quite a few times because that's the stage we are in the adoption curve. The advantage to this, as you can see here, and this is independent studies that were done by Cooper a couple of years ago, is that people seem to learn considerably faster in virtual reality, which is why I like it as an educator. And faster than classrooms and faster than e-learning, certainly. It's also more engaging if you've ever tried to learn things or go into classes or even just go into a, a group conference on, on Zoom like we're doing right now. It's easy to get distracted and people will go and have a coffee. That doesn't tend to happen in virtual reality. You get more focus and more focus means more engagement and more retention. As we can see here, the level of engagement and retention is considerably higher in virtual reality education, which is another reason that so many industries are adopting it and will ultimately end up adopting it for operational purposes. Now let's go back to some of the stuff that, that I've been doing over the past few years with uh, Riot. Um, we, we were aware that the technology was a little bit hard to implement, so we made these kind of virtual reality classroom in the box things so that people could just take out a headset or a whole series of headsets in a classroom and they'd be ready to go. They'd be connected to the internet. They would be logged in. They would be charged up and everything like that. We're not the only ones to have done this by any means, but we found that was really, really good for making it as simple as possible for people to use it because not everybody's a tech, right? Not everybody enjoys having to work things out and make things work, particularly in education. You've got your you've got your work cut out for you just keeping the classroom and in, in, in line and doing your job. So it has to be as simple as possible. Similarly, we were we were asked by Botswana to roll out during COVID uh, a virtual reality education program for 500,000 students. And I was aware that there's no way that the government could afford 500,000 headsets, which at the time were a grand apiece, thousand pounds apiece. Um, so we came up with a solution that would work on any device and would work anywhere that you had an internet connection. And we even came up with ways to put the data on the devices so that the people with the devices like mobile phones or that kind of thing, we could provide them with those and we could provide them with the SIM card that would mean that they weren't having to pay for the data. We started working with satellite connectivity for areas that didn't have phone connections, etc. Went really well. It's been rolled out about 12 colleges in three countries so far. So we're quite proud of that one. Now I'm just going to play a quick video which describes how and why that was important. Although we are capable of creating a virtual reality in a box solution, this solution actually only requires normal PC or Mac hardware that any student might have. For that, they can then access seminars, breakout sessions, office and team meetings from wherever they are using normal equipment. This also allows us to facilitate much larger events, public events, town hall meetings and just larger audiences if required for lectures. But for smaller groups, classrooms and other immersive virtual learning environments can be facilitated with free movement throughout the space. 
students and teachers can be provided with virtual reality headsets from our VR boxes, but none of this is actually required. So another thing that we did recently was <clears throat> some partners of ours in America and uh, the Canadians have come up with a way of putting live artificially intelligent translation into these systems. So you could be teaching multiple countries in hundreds of languages simultaneously, and not only will it come up with live captions in their language and dialect, but it will even read out. So I could be speaking in English, but in actual fact, simultaneously, people all over the world are hearing it in their language, their dialect. And um, so we're really happy with that one. Now, the energy industry is going through massive transition at the moment. And there's loads of new infrastructure because of the, uh, the net zero agenda and the decarbonization agendas across the world. So this is something that I want to highlight. OK, there are many, many jobs <laughs> right now and there will be over the next at least decade in uh, renewable energy, everything from engineering to uh, coordination of people to, um, you know, uh, general, the, there's all sorts of skills that would be required. But teaching these skills can be hazardous. Working with hydrogen, hazardous. Working at high use on a wind turbine, loads of hazards there, right? Working with high voltages for solar panel uh, farms. So how are you going to teach people that? You know, or how are you going to learn that? Well, largely speaking, it's going to be through virtual reality because the demand is unprecedented. There's no way that the traditional methods of teaching people these things are going to deliver enough skilled people in the time that we have left to do it. OK, so there are a ton of jobs coming in that sector and it's a massive sector. There's a massive variety of jobs. So let me show you how we're educating that sector right now. Renewable energy is a particularly demanding industry for training, with complex training requirements around a number of areas. Virtual reality allows safe and practical training on requirements such as working at heights or in confined areas, as well as intricate and potentially dangerous mechanical and electrical engineering tasks. Storing generated energy as hydrogen is particularly hazardous and requires a detailed knowledge of the controls, systems and materials involved. All of this can be taught safely in virtual reality, like filling and manual <laughs> valve operations, as shown here. All training operations are continuously monitored and shared, meaning that trainees, instructors, and assessors, located anywhere in the world, can join each other live in these virtual training environments. Sound and vision are just part of the picture. True training requires familiarity with actual controls, interfaces, and environments, for which we have a range of different physical simulators. VR and screen-based environments. Heavy machinery requires sensitive control to navigate around obstacles, which our simulators train in to the operator. Force feedback allows these operators to feel the movement and reactions of the machinery that they control, so we've made sure that our simulators do the same. This ensures that operators are familiar with the feeling of their system, as well as the sight, sound and sequence of tasks that they'll be undertaking in the real world. So sorry if that comes across as a bit salesy. That's, uh, that's the last one of the ones that we've made, and we're by no means the only ones who to develop this kind of training. Uh, there's loads of people out there that are developing this training all over the world. And like I say, there's far more demand than there are suppliers. So we tend to know them, like them, and work with them. So what to do is, if you are interested in getting involved in these kind of industries, then look for the ones that are delivering training through these kinds of methods, because they are the ones that are likely to succeed, <laughs> and therefore they're the ones that are likely to be a good bet for employment. But you could you could develop and deliver this kind of content and training for them. You don't need to be a techie person to do it. Some of the training that's being delivered is soft skills training, which is you know a one to one stuff and uh, learning how to converse with people and work with them properly. Um, so those ones require a degree of knowledge in that area. And then some of them require people with skills in animation, skills in design, visual design, skills in lesson planning, but all sorts of other things as well, like engineering and so forth. All of this creates jobs. So don't feel that you have to be a coder. Now, obviously, Dominic's uh, Skills Academy is the thing that will allow you to be able to do the practical skills that you need. It is worth doing that, even if it's just to learn what your codery people or your developer people are up against, what their limitations are, what their capabilities are, because then you can work with them better and create better content. You don't have to be that person. 
Okay, so here's some other examples of how this is being used across broader industries. This one was created by a company called Pixera, who are working in the oil and gas industry and have got an incredibly good suite of training for all sorts of high risk rules awareness training designed to safely introduce the rules in an interactive story driven approach a gate valve lockout device is what we need in this case let's place the permit on the stand great hey jump over the barrier and put that part back in the tray stop work what's wrong stop the crate stop the crate Oh God, Adam needs help! We need to save him! Watch out! The illegal. Oh, no, 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 no! So you can act and save lives in the real world. So like I say, that come to Copic, Sarah. Uh, the uh, what they highlighted and what various other kind of forms of uh, training and induction have highlighted to me is that you can try to prepare people for stressful situations. Imagine you're on an oil platform and it goes on fire and uh, you have to find your way to a, a lifeboat. Now, how they currently do that is when you arrive on the lifeboat, uh, when you arrive in the oil rig, they'll take you to your exit points. Uh, they'll take you to your lifeboat points. They'll show you how to, to operate the things separately and so forth. But that's all very well, but they might do that in a group. They might do that during the day when it's daylight. They might give you a card for, you know, that they'll show you what your exit routes are. But that's not how we respond in panic situations. We draw on memory. That's why they say your life flashes before your eyes. Your brain is trying to go, when did something like this happen to me before and I didn't die? <laughs> because that's what I need to do now. So that's how it works. And you're not going to get that from a laminated card, right? You're not going to get that from a, a bright sunny day with a group of people because when that fire occurs, you might be in your bunk, you might be somewhere else on the oil rig. It might be nighttime, it might be raining, there's going to be smoke and things collapsing in your way. You're going to have to change routes. You're going to have to respond in a very fearful situation when your prefrontal cortex, your big decision making bit of your brain is not really engaged and your amygdala, your tiny little almond shaped bits that handle fight, flight or freeze responses, they're engaged. The best way to prepare somebody for that is to put them through the actual experience and variations of those experiences in a believable way. Now, even doing 360 job interview training in virtual reality is quite stressful because it feels so real. But at least when you get into that situation and you're stressed out, you know what to do, right? So that, to me, is the best application of this kind of training because when you do get yourself in that life-threatening situation and your brain starts flicking through everything further, when did I do this and survive? It's got reference material that you've learned in safety, even though you didn't think you were safe. So here's some other offshore ones to look at. This is from a company called Digital Knots, who are also based as I am in Glasgow, and it's about moving operations. Things can go very badly wrong on a ship. Get it wrong. Now I'm going to turn this down a bit so that I can kind of narrate. It all sounds really calm. It's a nice sunny outdoor day. But what you're learning here is to avoid things that can cause damage to the ship and damage to yourself. The cables that you see here are under thousands and thousands of kilos of newtons of pressure and uh, so you need to make sure that your PPE, that's your personal protection equipment, you have on and it's all the right stuff and you know what to go out wearing because that will save you from damage. You also need to be able to observe and be aware of hazards on the deck like for instance oil spills because falling over or slipping when you're at sea can be really dangerous. Now look at this man's foot. He's throwing stuff and he's he's basically learning and showing you how to throw a rope and you get to actually learn by doing. You get to learn the appropriate swing. There we go. To get the thing into the into the right hook. But also, you see that caution sign there? That's where all of these coiled ropes are. That guy's foot is right in the midst of one. If he stays there, what's that? Now in reality that would have taken his leg right off. That one would have cut him in half. There are different versions of this training that show you that. And this stops you from putting yourself in these situations because you get to observe it. What you watch there is a PG version, which is an 18 rated one, which is pretty nasty. So that means that you can get the kind of training that you need to work offshore without having to go offshore.
dramatically increasing the likelihood of you getting work in those areas. Okay, now this is interesting. This is direct brain interfacing or brain computer interfacing, BCI, as it's sometimes referred to. I'll play this video and then I'll explain it to you a little bit more. I've designed CleverPoint, a wearable device seamlessly integrated into popular VR headsets to record and analyze a user biological response to the immersive experience. Today, our device monitors the brain electrical activity, the cardiovascular system, and the autonomic nervous system. But why would you need this? Let's see how you can benefit from this technology. Employers can assess the performance and attention of their employees within the recruitment process and day-to-day -day activities. In our pilot... Oops, sorry, my bad. Pilot projects, we are evaluating performance, concentration, risk of professional burnout, and stress resistance. Our technology helps employers make efficient use of employee skills and abilities, plan the scope of work, improve work environment, and safety. So, what does this tell us? Okay, this, these direct brain interfaces are installable on pretty much any consumer virtual reality headset, which makes it very accessible. It also has its concerns because you can actually hide them on there. And the new device that's, uh, that Apple's bringing out and a few other ones that are being brought out at the moment have the ability to kind of read your uh, behavior patterns through your pupil movements, through your eye movements, and, uh, and this kind of thing. That means that they can get information on you that you may not wish to share. So there is a role there for security and advice, um, for uh, they call it neuro rights, because it is basically the right to the privacy of what's going on in your own brain. Worth being aware of that because that's an emerging uh, job role which is coming out. But what is this used for when it's being used positively? Well, in this case, it was being used to avoid burnout, particularly in high stress. Oh God, sorry, that was my cat. <laughs> particularly in high stress uh, environments or high stress professions, like for instance, air traffic management, or um, actually navigating ships is another one, going back to the marine thing. But there's loads of other jobs where people are sitting relatively sedentary, but they're under such uh, pressure that they've got a buildup of adrenaline and it's not being worked out by physical activity. And that can cause all sorts of physical problems that are akin to diabetes because you've got a buildup of glucose in your bloodstream, which means hey, that your little arteries get blocked. And then David, that, yes. I just wanted to ask about something. You mentioned the eye tracking. And yes. the data from eye tracking. Now, Apple's new Vision Pro headset is set up so that no third party apps have access to the eye tracking data. And I just wonder do you think that, although that may improve privacy uh, to some extent, do you think that's going to be a drawback for some applications of the headset? Yes, that's a very good question, actually. One thing that Apple are very, very good at, apart from marketing, is privacy. Out of all of them, they are one of the best for that. Unfortunately, they're not the only one in the market, and there's already a large number of devices out there which have eye tracking, from right. the Vario from uh, Finland to uh, the new HTC uh, Vives and so forth. They all have eye tracking. And uh, there's even ways that you can implement eye tracking, obviously, through your uh, laptop computer. And it just picks up on where your face is, where your eyes are, and then it can, it can determine a great deal about your stress levels and so forth from the way that your eyes are moving. In training, we use it to try to work out how familiar people are with the scenario, because we know that less pupil or fewer pupil movements in a new environment indicates, well, familiarity. A surgeon will be able to, carry, an experienced surgeon will be able to carry out the same surgery in about a fifth as many movements, and therefore quicker and more efficient. A really experienced person, for instance, a first responder coming into an accident scene, will be able to take in the entire scene meaningfully in about a fifth of the eye movements. People glancing around all over the place in the case of their stress. People looking at things, holding their gaze, and particularly pupil dilation indicates that they like that thing. Now, that's really useful as a marketer because you can then tell that that positioning of that thing, that labeling of that thing, or you know, has, has worked in terms of getting people's attention. But it also means that you can use that information for advertising stuff at them. This is not something you necessarily want. So right. it's it it has its pros and cons. So for all that uh, Apple also has its pros and cons, I'm I really like. 
the fact that they've gone a, they've gone with a security first approach, and they always do. They always do in all their devices. Does that answer your question, or did I? Well, yeah, I'm 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 wondering. Do you think that a useful thing might be to uh, for the user to be able to grant permissions to a particular application, a particular app, uh, to use the eye tracking data, so that maybe there's a psychological study that you're doing or something like that, and they're participating in that. This would give them the ability to 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 carry that out. That is actually interesting because I helped to write a white paper for the XRSI people on neural rights. And I was suggesting very much as you described, because at the moment when you're sharing your information, your personal information with a third party, they have to have something called a double opt-in. So they have to give you two chances to opt in to sharing your information. Back in the day, you had to opt out. It was automatically assumed that you were okay to share your information with third parties unless you told people not to. And it was very easy to hide that checkbox away. So double opt-in means that People won't accidentally give their information, but they do have the capability to do so where they feel it is beneficial to them. So in answer to your question, yes, I think that would be a really good solution. And I wonder whether Apple will allow it. Time will tell. But when, I'm hoping that that's the approach that's adopted by everybody. When, when you say do, double opt-in, what exactly do you mean by that? That means that there's they basically have to ask you twice. Okay. Right? Yeah, so you, they have to say, first of all, do you want to share this information and then are you sure or some okay. variant thereof, yeah? So you can't do it by accident or okay. rather it's less likely. That's, okay? that's great information. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the question. And any other questions that you might have or anybody else uh, watching might have, please feel free to chip in. It makes this thing so much useful, more useful. Okay, so going back to the purposes of this one, it's really good for avoiding burnout. It's really good. I have used this device myself and I identified burnout before it happened. And it actually came with an app that allowed me to calm down. It actually tailored the, the calming meditation app to the forms of stress that I had. It was also able to identify the kind of learning behaviors that I had, the kind of things that I responded to when I became tired, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was incredibly useful. I used it for my brother-in-law and uh, it basically got him out of a job <laughs> that was stressing him out really badly because he realized that he was at way too high a level of, of ambient stress and it was just unsustainable. And he got out of that one and I think it was really good for him. Right, now here's another thing that you can do. Now we're moving away from the training side of things as well a little bit more. This is a guy that I know called David Thompson. He's been working with numerous companies on uh, the adoption of virtual reality for a long time. At the time that he made this video, uh, he was working with Gravity Sketch. Now I'm going to kind of fast forward through this because it's quite a long one. Let me see if I can find my cursor. Basically what he's doing here is he scanned this room now, this was about a year ago, so the scanning of rooms with mobile phones was a little bit ropey, as you can see, but it's got much, much better. Having scanned the room, he was then able to enter it in virtual reality, draw the things that were going to be placed in that room so, so you could see whether they would fit. OK, so for installation, again, we're in ships again. I promise I don't work in maritime. It's just for some reason, all the examples I have here are to do with ships and offshore stuff. But he could bring in objects at the real full scale put them in situ, and then work out whether they fit. Then he could bring other people in, either in virtual reality or just watching on a screen as we are, and show them what he was planning to put where. These could be electricians, they could be electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, they could be the people that have to use that space so that they can say yes or no to having this box placed in the space that they work in. Then he was able to actually very, very quickly draw the wiring diagrams. Now, David isn't a, well, he may well be a CAD specialist, a computer-aided design specialist, but you don't need to be, that's the thing. And then you can highlight and annotate the different things in that space and then point them out to other people. You can do recordings and so forth. Now, there are now numerous systems that can do this. You do not need to be an advanced virtual reality kind of a person to do this. But here's the interesting thing. A lot of people think you do. <laughs> so just familiarizing yourself with these apps, which usually are relatively cheap or even free to test out, can put you miles ahead of the curve in terms of employability because everybody else is too scared of it because they think you have to be some kind of clever tech guru to understand it. You really don't. What you saw there, 
clicking on a menu item and then drag and then carrying the thing to the wall and then drawing a line between uh, a green line between one area and another. Anyone could do that. But that puts you in a very, very small fraction of people who know how to do it or believe that they could know how to do it, which makes you employable. Now we're getting into smart manufacturing. Now, this is where we are basically using uh, artificially intelligent uh, robots or robots where we're coordinating their activities in manufacturing environments. These ones are called cobots. How can you tell what the difference is between a cobot and a robot? Well, first of all, a cobot is something that works alongside humans to help them. A robot doesn't sit in a cage. A robot generally is big and tough and strong and won't stop if you get in its way so you can get injured. So they have to they have to live inside the cage. Turn that in, but, um, whereas a cobot doesn't. A cobot you can have working right next to you, uh, alongside you on a production line, doing the hazardous stuff. And if you get in the way or it touches you, it will stop. There's no risk. But you can then also use virtual reality to coordinate everything that is going on in that smart factory. You can see what all of the robots are doing. You can see what's going where between them. You can manage that as if you were there, but you could be in the other side of the world. This is what we call a digital twin, where you're creating a virtual representation, a virtual twin of the factory. And the digital twin bit comes in where it's giving you live sensor information or camera feeds from that virtual twin, allowing you to coordinate the whole thing as if you were there. That means that you can potentially coordinate multiple factories and even the activities between multiple factories um, from anywhere in the world. Again, massive employability factor there, particularly if you're a specialist in a certain area and the company doesn't want to employ multiple specialists, one for each venue. They want to have one dude to handle all of them. So again, knowing that digital twins exist and knowing that you can control these semi-autonomous uh, helper robots can really give you an advantage in employability. So digital twinning is something to look at. And remember that what a lot of people call digital twins are just 3D representations of a space. That isn't a digital twin, that's a virtual twin. Okay? Digital twins are the ones where you've got live data moving from one to the Okay, I will move on. Now this also extends to very, very heavyweight lifting. Now I remember about two years ago, we were asked by, I believe it was BAM Nutto, uh, if there was a way that we could have robots that we could control remotely that would be able to carry three tons or more in weight. And there weren't. You could get cranes, but you couldn't get robots that could really handle that. These things have now hit the market and they can handle about 10 tons of weight. So they're really good for, again, smart factories. And again, they're usually guided by, as it says here, QR tapes, which are just put along the, the, the ground, or by a kind of a digital twin process, which has its fundaments in virtual reality. So these are other, and this is extremely high value to these industries. The savings that we're talking about here, particularly safety and productivity, are in the, in the tens of millions, you know, per company, per venue, per year. So they will pay for this, and they are looking for people that know how to do it. Next, now here's interesting. This is Forensic in, uh, Investigations. This is a company called River Reality in Virtual Reality, who, uh, and the guy who's narrating this is called Alex Harvey. He's a He's a big dude in this industry. I like him a lot. And I'm going to step into the scenario. And I'm going to take a photo as I come in, just around the room. And now I can also get the camera, uh, sorry, the torch. And now the torch comes into its own when you can use it in an environment like this. So here... Because we've scanned every single object, we can interact with them. So I might want to look underneath this uh, toaster. So we get to see the protection marks underneath. And we get to look at it in more detail. And now I can evidence the item with this controller. So you see my thumb over here. We can push down there, evidence the item. And now that goes into the lab. So it's now over here on the side, and we can see it in much better light. And we can even look at, you know, what food was last cooked in there. So we'll put that back on there. We've added another thing to investigate that allows you to dig a bit further. 
So down here, it looks like there's a lot of damage around this bin. So I want to dig a bit further down. So if you put the controller in, you can see you can touch this floor area. And as we touch it, you pull the trigger. And it says, in order to excavate this area, we need to evidence on the thumb pad. So you can press dig on this controller, and then it digs a bit further down. There you go. So we've just dug down another layer. Now we can move the bin out of the way. Just to get a lot closer to what's underneath. Let's just take a photo while we're there of the plugs. Cool. So did you see there that uh, the on the on the ground, or rather when he got behind that pile of detritus and behind the bin, there was a scorched yeah. plug socket. Now, in forensic fire investigation, you have to be trained to be able to work out where did the fire come from? Was it arson or was it something which might occur naturally again that you want to avoid happening again? For instance, the plug-in air fresheners have been the culprits of many, many house fires. And it was only through this kind of forensic fire investigation that they were able to work this out and then go back to the people that manufactured them and make sure that they put in more fire safety um, uh, safeguards. Now, what River have been doing is this kind of first response for forensic examination of police crime scenes, murder scenes, fire scenes, and enabling people to learn stuff to a level that you would normally have to work with some real specialists, which are very hard to come by in these uh, in, this, in these in these services. So this is great for people doing jobs much, much better and getting access to much, much higher level training, which is developed by some of the best people in the world. Okay, now we're going to get to the interactive bit. So I want you to get out your phones and I want you to switch it on and switch on the camera and point it at this QR code. Now I'd like you to put into the chat when you have done this, okay, I am going to move on from this, uh, and basically it should bring up a link, a short link, and you just click on that short link, and you should be taken to a form of augmented reality that requires no apps to be downloaded in your phone. This is called web-based augmented reality. This is giving you the ability to place virtual objects in the context of the real world without any of the friction points of having to download some stupid app to be able to do it. Much in the same way that QR codes themselves required you to download apps to use them until they became ubiquitous on all people's phones. Now I'm going to move on to the next slide to show you how to use this when it loads up. It will take a little while because it's quite a high resolution model. Don't worry, I'll bring up the QR code again if you haven't managed to do it the first time around. This is what you should see. Actually, what you'll see is a jet engine, a, 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 an aircraft jet engine, but the overall screen that you'll see will have that little box on the top right hand side. It will also have those two arrows left and right. The two arrows left and right will allow you to move through different stages of the model and animations and bits of activity. The box in the top right is what takes it from just being on your screen on your phone to actually placing it in the real world. So I'm going to show you what this looks like because I did this about 10 minutes before we started. It should bring up this jet engine. You can move backwards and forwards to the animations. If you click on the box in the top right, which I should be doing shortly. It says view in AR, and that's my dining room. And there it is, it's appearing in there. And I'm moving it around with my finger, and by pinching in and out, I'm scaling it up and down. And by pushing the arrows, I can go through the animations and view these things in context. Now, this is capable of opening these things up at accurate scale to within about 2% scale accuracy. So you could have a jet engine exactly the same size as a jet engine in front of you, and you can see inside it in context. Or you could have the inside of a wind turbine or the workings of a wind turbine whilst you're in a wind turbine to tell you what to do next. So I'm going to go back to this QR code, and let's see if you've managed to access this. Oops. Back to the QR code. <clears throat> and I'm just going to check the chat just to make sure that everybody's got it. Not seeing anything yet. Okay. That's fine. If anybody, oops, yep. You got it? Excellent. So I want you to have a little play with that. I won't be I won't be annoyed if you're uh, playing with a jet engine whilst I'm talking about the next bit, because I'm about to have a bit of a rant, and it's probably best if you're not. <laughs> paying too much attention. I can be a little bit opinionated when it comes to certain things in this world. So, um, okay. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, 
I my phone battery is dead, which I just found out. But uh, I was curious, what did you use to implement this? That is a system called Jigspace. There are other web-based augmented reality systems out there. There's Eighth Wall, which is based uh, built by a company called Niantic, arguably one of the most uh, sophisticated ones, but hugely expensive <laughs> per activation. Um, the other one is Yord. What, I think it's J-O-R-D or maybe Y-O-R-D. Uh, and it's very much like Jigspace. Jigspace is a steering company. Yord is, I believe, a Dutch company. And they all provide web-based augmented reality solutions of one kind or another. And they're well, all arguably awesome. So how expensive was this to create this? This one, uh, if you take the model out of the equation, because a lot of these models you can actually get on uh, Sketchfab or, or various kind of model uh, directories right. online. So yeah, I made one for the pharmaceutical industry, oh, oh let me see, uh, a few months ago. And it was like a 17 stage animation of, on a retractable syringe for the pharmaceutical industry. And that one cost about to, uh, 20,000, but that was for us to build it, right? right. So, in terms of our costs that you know and on running it on that platform it was in the hundreds the low hundreds really okay and it probably yeah, depends yeah. on your bandwidth how many viewers you have and things like that it does yes because you pay to access and then you pay per view or you can pay for a, a lot of views but very much in the whole cost cpm like cost per thousand views that you get on uh, on digital advertising so there's there's different ways of doing it the highest the most expensive is eighth wall but it's probably the most sophisticated and then these two yard and uh, jigspace are really damn good and so much cheaper okay. <laughs> so yeah okay Great so and, no problem at all so we're getting into uh why this is important. Okay, why is this important? It's great that we can access this stuff in our mobile phone, but we're not always going to be bringing out our phone and staring at stuff for ages in the real because it's going to it's going to use up one of your hands for a start. Uh, and it's just not a natural way to engage with the world. So that's why we're, wearable augmented reality is a big, big deal. Begin rant. Uh, the, <laughs> we started off with things like slot and augmented reality and head-mounted display, uh, augmented reality, quite heavy stuff you wouldn't wait out and about. We are now here. There are now uh, sleek kind of glasses, basically, that you can wear uh, out and about, and they are being adopted in certain countries, of, as always, in the Far East is the fastest adopters. We will, and these have already been built, uh, be wearing or could be wearing contact lenses and devices which you can't actually tell that people are wearing but I think that's going to be a while coming because not everybody wants to wear contact lenses and we don't yet have display direct brain interfaces um, yet. So there's two kinds of wearable augmented reality. One of them is called waveguide. Now as you can see here that means that there's a little tiny projector in your glasses there and it is bouncing the uh, signal down through the lens in a very clever way that guides the waves of light back to your eye. So the things look like sunglasses, but when you switch on the projector, you're seeing a heads-up display, a digital overlay. Or there's a simpler way, as you can see here, the combiner, which just does it at an angle, kind of a pepper's go effect. Now, these two examples that I'm showing you here, one's called formerly Nreal, it's a, a Chinese company, uh, and uh, they're now called Xreal. Um, and the other one is called Views Explained. There's numerous out there. Do you notice that they look, largely speaking, like slightly ugly glasses? But you would, I would think, be relatively comfortable wearing them in the street. They also have the advantage that if they fail, they just become sunglasses. Now, let me show you the alternative. This is called pass-through. Pass-through is a bit like your mobile phone. You are effectively looking at a screen or two little screens that are in front of your eyes, like in a virtual reality headset. The outside world is passed through to that lens, to that um, display from a camera, just like in your mobile phone. The advantage to that is opacity. You get really nice, solid, high resolution images. You get a much wider field of vision, and it's being used by the likes of Meta, the uh, Quest 3, uh, Pico with the Pico 4 and uh, Apple with their muted um, uh, Apple Vision Pro. Great. However, if that fails, you're blind. <laughs> you're wearing a thing that has just gone black, and until you can get both of your hands free and get it off your head, you can't see anything. Now I want you to imagine 
which one you're going to use if you're working in industry. Something that when it fails and you're hanging off an electricity pylon or you're crossing the street or you're, or you're climbing a ladder has just turned into sunglasses or something which has rendered you blind and you don't have your hands free and you can't take it off, which one's the one that industry is going to use? So I'm going to be focusing <laughs> on the one that industry is going to use. You can use these ones for design, for safe environments, for safe spaces, but you would definitely not want to be using that in a hazardous environment, which effectively eliminates about 80 to 90% of workplace applications. Okay, rant over. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I am quite opinionated in this one. I believe that this is the future. So that was about uh, two years ago. Uh, that was about a year ago. And that was this year. So you can see how that these are already getting smaller and more slimline all the time. These are the actual uh, views through the uh, the X reel. Um, so you get to see that yes, there's a little bit of you can see through it a little bit. You know, a bit of ghosty effects. But and it's not as sophisticated in terms of display as the uh, as the big pass through ones. But it is pretty good. Okay. So what would we use this for? Here's an example. You're using your wearable augmented reality headsets. You're on a construction site and you're trying to make sure that the design has been adhered to by the people doing the construction. You can immediately overlay the actual design, the BIM model, building information model, onto the construction and see if it's changed. There's usually a big difference between as designed and as built and that causes massive problems. But also you can go back in time with this. That building could be completely built, but you need to know where the pipes or the wiring are. How are you going to do that? Well, you just use a device like this to go back in time and see where the pipes and the wiring were installed. Not necessarily from a 3D model like this, but potentially from captures, 3D captures that were taken during the process of the building of the structure. So that you know for sure that that wire is right under where you were just about to stick your screwdriver and therefore not to do that. Here's some other examples of this having been done. This is uh, obviously for sewage works and that kind of thing and drainage works. And the model has been captured. It's been geo-referenced to that area. And it means that you can see what's going on under the ground, inside that, and then even on the outside without having to even take a manhole cover up. Just a nice brief example of how you can see the unseen and you can see into the past when something that you're wearing in your head. Next, so as you can see, these are the stock data that's been captured. Again, it's, like, it's showing you the difference between that and that's designed, but it should give you the confidence of that this is what's meant to look like in civil engineering, as it says here, construction projects, energy projects, etc. Here's how this can be captured. This is a, a confined area drone. It's in a cage so that the little propellers don't hit off things and doesn't ping around the space, so it's relatively safe. These are used in mining, sewer access, confined space access, no man entry, which is areas that you don't want to put human beings, but you can put a drone and it can go in there, it can map it, using what we call photogrammetry, taking lots of photos and turning them into 3D models, or NERF, neural radiance field, which is really a more sophisticated version of the same. It takes into account light levels and reflection levels and so forth and gives you a really accurate model from fewer photographs or video. And as you can see here, that means that you have now got a virtual twin, or if you've got IoT sensors along the line of that, a live digital twin. That means that you can potentially, using, uh, for instance, live beacons on somebody who's in that mine, find and rescue somebody who's lost in there, find something which has collapsed or gone wrong in there, and numerous other benefits like high gas levels or whatever in mining without risking anybody's life. Here's another application for it, guiding your engineering so that you can see what's wrong. wrong without well so it, you know you're going it's not working i don't know why it's not working it's using intelligent machine vision or computer vision to identify that thing switched off that thing is switched on that thing is out of alignment meaning that all your guesswork is taken away and you can actually understand immediately what's wrong with the thing and that means you don't have to call the mechanic out because you can be told what to do next <clears throat> 
here's another computer vision that has got numerous applications. And again, these are good areas to learn. This system is picking up that that person is leaning forward in a bad way that's putting strain on their back. Live, it's identifying the high-strain high, high areas. And then they can watch that video back later on and go, ah, oh, see, that's why my lumbar is hurting really badly, or that's why my knees have gone. Because this thing is saying that what you did there, that was the wrong thing to do. And then you can it can even guide you on here's a better way to pick things up, to move things around. Which can save massive amounts of money in terms of lost earnings or lost productivity to the organization. But I think most importantly, it saves people's quality of life. The amount of people who have had to give up their job and then be in pain for the rest of their lives simply because they were doing the wrong thing without realizing it at their work for a number of years. And that's them. They're in painkillers for the rest of their lives. So to avoid that, even in one person, is worth installing in every factory, in my opinion. Now, back to the as built as design thing. You do not necessarily need to have... Um, a virtual reality headset on. This is a torch, an augmented reality torch, which projects the uh, image of what is beneath the surface of the walls based on previous stats. This was developed by some guys I'll share the links to later on in uh, Liverpool. And they realized they actually created it as a, as a kid's thing so you could look through the bedroom wall into a magical land or monster thing or whatever. But they realized that you could use this for BIM models, for uh, as-built models, and get in there and go, I don't want to cut into the wall here because there's a pipe here. Imagine how useful that could be for plumbing, for mechanical engineering, for electrical engineering, and no headsets required, just a torch. Getting into a little bit more projection mapping, and incidentally, projection mapping is just projections, projectors, that take into account the shape of the thing that they're projecting onto and adjust accordingly. They map it accordingly. But this is being used to help guide assembly. Now, in some specialist assembly and manufacturing, the same person is going to be expected to put together loads of different kinds of devices every day. It's not a question that they're doing the same thing again and again and again, and they just know how to do it by row. So this guides them how to do it perfectly every time, even if they've never assembled this in their life. Because much better for small batch manufacturing, it tends to be the highest value also being used to show what's going on under people's skin and under people's surfaces in surgery, in physiotherapy, and so it means that before a cut's made, it's made in the right place. And that can save a massive amount of time and recovery time and pain for the user. Getting a little bit further into medicine, we're getting into haptics. Now, haptics are where you can feel the thing that's happening in the virtual reality world. And there are numerous devices out there, but this is, I would argue, one of the most sophisticated because it covers your entire body. It can give you uh, the sensation of movement. It can even control your muscles through TENS electrical actuators. It can help people recover from strokes, but it can also help to guide people in various forms of training and so forth and pick up on their heart rates, their galvanic skin response, how much they're sweating, much like lie detectors do, to work out whether they're stressed or whether they're under too much stress. Quick video. Tesla Suit is a human-to-digital interface, the only of its kind. A powerful new tool for next-gen enterprise training solutions. Tesla Suit provides deeper sensory immersion in VR environments, enabling users to safely experience stressful, hazardous scenarios as though they've lived them. Critical operating procedure is trained into reflex with haptic feedback, increasing safety and reducing risk of production delays and on-the-job injury. Tesla Suit outputs motion capture and biometrics. Trainers monitor performance and stress levels to ensure users are prepared to perform under pressure. And the Tesla Suit SDK supports easy integration with existing training applications. To accelerate mastery and scale expertise in your organization, contact us at teslasuit.io. Tesla suit. So this Master is a really reality. interesting piece of kit because it's not just used for training, it's used for medical um, stuff. So it's used for things like physiotherapy, where your physiotherapist can be picking up on your movements and what you're doing right and wrong from anywhere in the world. Um, they don't have to be right there with you. It's also being used in sports training, boxers, ballet dancers, uh, gymnasts, to make sure that their movement is appropriate, is being done correctly and isn't going to injure them. So there's tons of uses beyond just industrial. Is this and from this Tesla, the car company? 
No, it's not. Uh, actually, it's a Tesla suit as its own company and was, I think, around before Tesla. Um, they are from the uh, Serbia, I believe, the country of Nikolai Tesla's birth. So arguably, they have a better claim to it. Yeah, <laughs> <Okay. you> know, <laughs> um, now, they have also created, and numerous other people have created, haptic feedback gloves. Now, this is the earliest area of adoption, I would say or will be, because you're not always going to put on something akin to a wetsuit, no matter how uh, easy Tesla suit have made these to don, you can just zip them on, zip them off. But um, you can put on a pair of gloves, and people use their hands for a great deal. It's one of our primary sensory organs beyond the ones on our head. So therefore, it's a really good way to feel through force feedback, which I'll show you actually right now, um, by stopping your fingers when you grip onto a hard object then you can see that it's really there. By sending pressure sensors and even fiber sensors to your fingertips, you can see that they're picking things up. There are different devices that can do this in different ways, ranging in cost from a few hundred pounds to a few tens of thousands of pounds. But they will get cheaper and better. And certainly for this kind of accurate control in virtual reality, it's a much better way to do it. If you've ever woken up having, you know, laying in your hand and your hand's gone numb and you've tried to do something with your hand when it goes numb, how difficult is it to do that accurately? Well, that's everybody in virtual reality ever because they can't feel the thing that they're touching, right? But if you've got, if you've got haptic feedback gloves, now you can feel your hands. Now you can really learn the kinesthetics of the task or engage with your virtual twin much more accurately because you're feeling what the robot's feeling or you're feeling what the sensor's feeling. Now we're getting into another thing that there's a massive demand for. There are specific forms of augmented and virtual reality training for specific industries. And remember I said to you before that there's far more demand for emerging technologies and renewable energy technologies and then can possibly be met by conventional training systems. Also, these conventional training approaches tend to be very, very high carbon. So there's ways to save on carbon and energy expenditure by implementing an element, at least, of virtual or augmented reality in the training. Observe. This is an augmented reality welding system, which allows students to learn how to weld in complete safety and to be assessed and reviewed either locally or from assessors anywhere in the world. Here they can view the quality of their welds from any angle afterwards, and even using customized jigs like these, they can practice welds that they may only encounter in their industry. This system doesn't seek to replace conventional welding training, but rather to augment it. As we can see here, complex welds can be practiced first in augmented reality before the student then tries them on physical machines, reducing time and costs to qualification. Now I've done welding training conventionally, and you have to use a bunch of gas, a load of electricity, and every single metal piece that you weld together, you have to destruction test, which is to say you have to rip it apart in a vise to see whether your weld was stronger than the surrounding metal. The costs of all of this are fast, and the carbon, the waste of it is huge. And uh, for colleges or training centers that are putting through thousands of students every week, it's a massive expense and it's a massive source of carbon unnecessary carbon dioxide. So this is a way to reduce it dramatically. And it doesn't replace the whole thing. It just adds in a central section. I went to a college called Witness College and a friend of mine, Craig Scott now, uh, he's a welding trainer and an experienced welder. He tested me out doing a single weld originally. I can sh share the video with you later on. And my weld was awful. And then he ran me through another system we call from like an electrical, the Vertex system. And I had 30 minutes of training in that. And then I went back and did the real world weld. And he said it was probably about three weeks down the line in terms of how much better it was. 30 minutes. Imagine the savings. Okay, now we're getting on to the final bit. And I hope we're okay for time because I can't see my clock here. Data science and stakeholder engagement. This is what's most important. Um, trying to get across data information to multiple people that have different uh, levels of understanding or backgrounds, speak different languages, etc., can be very, very difficult without having them in the same place and being able to talk to them live. Virtual reality allows you to take live data or recorded data from any format, get everybody from all around the world in the same virtual room and observe this content and discuss it so that everybody understands it massive time savings and rather than having to periodically fly groups together massive carbon savings as well
Analyze global data in real time together with your whole team no matter where they are in the world. As well as viewing data in three dimensions, snapshots of different analyses can be saved around your space to be selected for more detailed viewing at any time. Geographical selections can be zoomed in on for more detailed viewing. And vast data sets can be uploaded and processed in seconds to be viewed in a wide variety of formats, which can be much easier to understand when viewed in 3D, like this histogram of population characteristics, which simply makes more sense when viewed as a volume. Or this network graph of air traffic, which indicates the busiest airports by size and numbers of connecting flights, with those connecting to each other most frequently grouped in communities by colour. Here we can see how different music tastes and favourite artists relate to each other based on people's Spotify listening habits. The large red nodes indicate highly popular artists like Drake, while the blue and yellow nodes indicate less well-known artists. Temporal analyses show dynamic trends developing over time, in this case housing prices in the United States. And this analysis of online buying behaviour shows how information can be seen for age, website engagement and average purchase value. Artificial intelligence helps to identify outliers and other points of potential interest. While the group viewing format allows stakeholders from all over the company to understand and discuss the data together, allowing for detailed, actionable insights. And that is the end of my screen share. So, oh, there we go, I have run over, I'm sorry everyone. Uh, they usually that that kind of information requires data scientists. Data scientists cost a lot of money and they're usually at PhD level and there's not enough of them. <laughs> also, a lot of people can't understand the language that data scientists speak because they've got to PhD level and they now speak PhDs, which is not something that every stakeholder can understand. However, one of them in a room or one of the people who has translated the information and my colleague Andy was able to take in uh, jet propulsion ana analysis and rocket launch statistics from a, a file and show them, even though he has no background in this, and actually explain what was going on with minimal training to somebody who didn't know anything about it at all. So it means that you can access and democratize the information sharing really, really easily with less specialists and to explain them. So if somebody's looking at that information and goes, I, I don't know what I'm looking at here, I don't understand, then the person or people in the room who do understand can at that point explain it to them after which they do understand and they can be the person to explain to other people. But mainly it's about understanding information and it's about engaging different stakeholders as to say anybody within or out with the organization who has a stake in the outcome of the decision. So there we go. That is the end of my presentation and I've gone way over, but I had a lot to talk about and I drank far too much coffee. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask me about any of this stuff? Yeah, this has been just a fascinating talk. Thank you for this. And um, what I'm curious about is you've been following this technology so closely. I'm wondering if you have a feel for when the lightweight glasses, not the ones that make you go blind when the batteries run out, <laughs> when, when do you think the lightweight glasses would be cost effective enough for consumer applications such as replacing your phone's display? They already are. Uh, they just haven't actually been adopted mass market in the UK or in the United States yet. So in China, they already have been adopted, much as QR codes were adopted several years in advance of the rest of the world in uh, China and Japan. The N real glasses or now X real glasses I was talking about, four hundred pounds, four hundred dollars. You okay. attach them to your phone, it does the work. Done. They are oh, not the only. So, so it's yeah. there. The technology is there. That's the beauty of this industry is that anytime somebody asks me about is the technology there for this, like you know, even when I say not yet, yet could be a week away, a day away, yeah. and this is incredibly fast. And I used to be in digital marketing, which I thought was a fast moving industry until I got into this industry. And then I realized that it was moving at a snail space. So Dominic will back me up on this one. Every single morning I wake up and I'm an amateur again. You don't get to be a specialist in this industry for any more than a few hours because it just will leave you behind, you know? Yeah, it's like the world changes every week. Absolutely. 
absolutely every day. So it's uh, it's exciting for people like me who have a, a chronically short attention span <laughs> because it keeps things interesting. I will never get bored of this one because every day is different, you know? Yeah, so yeah. Have you got any thoughts about what you might want to apply that technology to? Well, I think... I think it's inevitable that it's going to replace the the phone screens. And one of the things I think about, the Vision Pro just came out. And when would Apple be coming out with these types of glasses that would basically take over for that Vision Pro? It's happening so quickly. Poor old Tim Cook. That's what he wanted. And the people that developed it, uh, this is hearsay, by the way, this might be nonsense. And right. I heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. So don't take me out my word. But what I heard was that Tim Cook wanted the glasses because he said, well, that's that's got the most functionality. And the people within Apple wanted to make the goggles. They wanted to make the pass-through devices. So they said, okay, we'll make the glasses if you give us budget to work in the pass-through device. And then they used 90% of the budget on the pass-through device and 10% begrudgingly on the glasses, which are yeah. nowhere because they didn't get the investment of time and money and the goggles came out. So it's not for one of the guy trying, but it might be a while. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if other companies are going to step up uh, and fill that gap with their own uh, lightweight glasses uh, to replace those phone displays. There's currently 15 companies in the market with glasses that are fully functional. Uh, you know, that you can buy from Enreal through to uh, Third Eye. Uh, I think I, I mentioned Vuzix and the Vuzix Blade systems. There's tons of them out there. They're mostly in industry and they mostly yeah. have industrial applications, but the Enreal slash Xreal is definitely a consumer device. Dominic, can you think of any other ones? I think Rokid have got one, haven't they? Uh, um, Unreal, I, I think Ant. Ant has another glass. I think when I was at AWE, I saw um, from China, right? And and Xreal, Xreal, they have a lot. It, it's probably from Asian, I think Korea or somewhere. But uh, Xreal, um, has the glass that they kind of, uh, is very high end and is transparent, just like your glass. And also they put a lot of ads, which they compare themselves, uh, to uh. Apple Vision Pro. So for example, they were thinking about the UI looks like this and they compare with Apple. It seems like Apple is learning from them because they are launching earlier. So they are doing some comparison, which is very interesting that, uh, and they even said that we are smaller and we are just a, a very, very lightweight glass. And you know, Apple is like 3,500 and we are just 500. Which one are you going to buy? We are the inspiration of Apple and also we are much cheaper and we are cooler. So it's, it's interesting to see that Apple is late in the game. And uh, you mentioned on the slide that uh, uh, head mounted device uh, versus the, the more like a glass, nor, uh, fashionable glass, and you prioritize that one and you have a lot of things. And it seems like, oh, of course that uh, one time when I wear Ray-Ban and a smart glass partner with Meta, that one mm -hmm. I wear, I wore it to, to have it, burger, uh, burger place. And I wore it and there's a light shiny because I was trying to, you know, test it out uh, how the recording works because I was working uh, in the kind of like media and camera team. I was just, just trying to see uh, how to interact with the normal glass so I can get some inspiration for the VR part of more like a media part. So I wore it and there's a light here and I wore it and I was telling somebody that, hey, I want a, a burger or something, order a burger. And the cashier didn't even notice that there's a light shining or something and it's totally recorded. And the person in front of me couldn't even know that I'm recording the entire process. So imagine if I wear that Apple Vision Pro, then people might mm -hmm. want you to, hey, what are you doing right now? So mm -hmm. I've seen people who say in their video reviews of it, who tried it out, they say, oh, I, as soon as I get one of these, I'm going to wear it while I'm driving. And I think, please don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Maybe in the future, it will be self-driving car. So you can definitely wear yeah. it if car drive itself, right? <laughs> I just wonder... I just wonder if uh, there could be some small disruptive company 
that could suddenly explode on the scene with these lightweight glasses to be used as a phone display. And they don't really need the cooperation of the phone maker to, to do it. Maybe they could just do it, pull it off on their own. What do you Maybe think about that? Well, the, the, the fact that mobile phones are ubiquitous and the fact that everybody owns one and we tend to update our own phones means that if you want to keep the, the device that you're wearing slimline and lightweight, heavy is very bad when you've got it on your head for a long period of time, right? Then why not just connect it by wire to the thing that you know the person owns anyway? i.e. their phone and it can do the heavy lifting it can do all the processing all the battery life it knows where it is it knows what angle it's at it knows everything and that means that the cost of developing the glasses is much lower the weight yeah. of the glasses is much lower the, you know the uh, size of the glasses is much slimmer so i think it'll be a while before consumer-based glasses go completely standalone May, but i say a while in this industry that could mean a year or two years yeah uh, yeah but at the moment, I think we'll continue to leverage that connection for a little bit longer because it just makes sense. Um, and then, you know, when the costs go down and they get the chip sizes down, then they may well go standalone. There are devices like that out there. I believe the Vuzix, uh, the new Vuzix um, system is completely standalone. I know the third eye one is, um, but it, they don't, they, they're, they're a bit more specialist. They don't have as many functions as a mobile phone does. And I think that... When Apple does eventually catch up with this, they'll make something that looks awesome. They always do. They'll yeah. get the general public using them, even people who aren't techie at all. They always do. This really is why everybody was so excited about the x real glasses, not because of the functionality of them or the cost of them or the fact that everybody would use them, but just the fact that they had entered the market meant that that was going to catapult this technology into the public stage. That was a real yeah. advantage. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, just one last one thing though. Dominic mentioned the X Real glasses. They're out of Beijing in China. The guy who started this was an engineer for Magic Leap, which was a similar type of glasses, which promised too much and delivered too little and kind of didn't do so well. There's a new version which is much better, but unfortunately, they're tarred by the brush of their initial launch. One of their engineers left, went to Beijing. And then mysteriously came out with something very, very similar, which we call the x glasses in a land yeah. where, uh, you know, you can basically the idea of IP is anathema. Uh, so, you know, you can get away with it. I didn't think they were going to make it into the West. I thought they would, they would fall in a hail of IP losses, but they didn't. Uh, the problem is them and Pico, who arguably do the best, lowest cost virtual reality headsets, is that they are a Chinese company, which unfortunately for a lot of governments and companies means they just won't touch them. You know, they, they worry about data and that kind of thing. Same reason that a lot of companies and education establishments won't touch Meta because it's Facebook. And that means it's, it's hoovering up your data from your school children, from your employees. Can't have that. The things are cheap because their loss leaders are subsidized by the data that they, that they harvest. So, um, you know, they got better, but that's the brush that they tarred them with, themselves with at the, at the outset. So if you want something that you know is not going to do that in the virtual reality world, that's your Vive headsets. In the augmented reality world, that's going to be your Apple ones. So you kind of have to pay for that security. And that slows things down a bit. I think an interesting thing is that if you're creating a new technology, you have to consider at some point where to file your patents. And it becomes very expensive if you want to try to file patents that are effective over a large range of countries. Mm -hmm. So for a place like China, they have their own huge market. So uh, if a company wants to use technology that is not patented in China, but is patented in the U.S., they already have a huge market that they can that they can work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can't really patent things in the, in the Far East anyway. Uh, you know, you can try, but it's not worth it. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not enforceable. You can patent things in Europe with a single patent that covers the entirety of Europe and North America. And if you cover both of those, that covers largely your, your, your largest markets in my experience. But yeah, it's difficult. And as soon as it hits the the, the Far East that will be get copied and it will get chunked out anyway. So it's really a matter of time. The main way that you protect your IP is by continuing to develop. Yeah. That way, yeah. Yep, everybody else is catching up then. Uh, yeah. And with the one at the front runner. It's only the only real, real way to do it. Uh, which is fine because the industry moves that faster 
people generally are developing at that speed anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that in the future that all the technology will merge? For example, like at AWE, the a lot of leaders start saying that XR will be the platform for AI to 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 thrive, right? So for example, yesterday I saw just just like you previous said that David, you said that oh every day I wake up there's something new and keep I'm I have ADD as well, so I I really love involved in XR. And I'm the hands-on person. So every time when there is something, I just want to do it, do it, do it. And it's just so fun. And uh, yesterday I saw Shape XR create the chatbot inside VR space. They put AI inside uh, VR space and they are the kind of like more like a, a creating tools like Archeo or, you know, some other types of like a VR creation tools. So mm -hmm. at that point, for example, like the education before we thought like, oh, education limited only in school and later on it becomes uh, because of social media or news or something, it becomes, everybody becomes its own educational channel, right? Mm -hmm. And later on, you see, it becomes chepa. It means that maybe a, an AI or plugin becomes your teacher. It can teach you a lot of stuff. So uh, a lot of transformation, like before our original traditional mindset that our oh, teacher need to be at school and need to pay expensive tuition fee. Now everything break out. So what do you see about, for example, like I heard <laughs> one, one kind of like a business guru in China, he, she predict that in the future, there's only 4% of people has jobs and 96% of people get universal basic income and then do anything that they want, which means that they can create something else and make their dream come true because you don't need to do any labor things, for example, like farming, uh, factory, even creativities, like somehow a little labor, for example, like a lawyer, attorney, a lot of member memory requires stuff, repetitive stuff was being taken care of pretty soon. So yeah, so what do you see the future? And uh, do you think that there's anything that human can do? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's three questions, I suppose. So the convergence of technology, uh, my background in marketing taught me to look into the past and look at the recurrent trends, right? And convergence of technology is, uh, is a recurrent trend. It happens inevitably, there's cycles of it. Even if you go back pre-humans, convergence of uh, energy, you know, many, many uh, plants getting eaten by fewer grazers, getting eaten by fewer predators, ultimately is the convergence of energy, right? The same thing happens with uh, businesses. The, the, the small ones get hoovered up by the larger ones, and then they end up, you know, selling everything. Look at your Yamahas and your Mitsubishis and so forth, everything from pianos to motorbikes to saxophones, whatever. Um, so that happens in business. Look at your your mobile phone. It's a camcorder. It's a dictaphone. It's a phone, China. <laughs> it's a computer. It's a, so many different things converged into this one thing that we carry in our pockets, right? So it is inevitable that we are going to get a convergence of a lot of the currently emerging technologies onto our devices. And those devices are highly unlikely to be something that we have to hold in our hand simply because it's inconvenient. Something more convenient is going to be an easier way to do it. Will that be glasses? Will it be some form of direct brain interface that doesn't even require glasses? Um, who knows? Might be. Uh, I put out an April Fool's joke a, a, a few months ago uh, implying that I'd got a Neuralink put in. I do apologize to anybody who believed me on that one. I'm still getting, how are you doing? And get well soon messages from people. I didn't put a Neuralink in my brain. The blood brain barrier exists for a very good reason and sticking wires <laughs> a very bad idea. However, yes. you can do it passively through something called uh, uh, temporal interference. It's kind of rudimentary at the moment, but if you send very high frequency electromagnetic waves through your brain, they won't affect it. They'll just pass directly through. But where they cross, cross over, they interfere with each other's wave lengths and slow them down to a bioresonant frequency, which means it will basically vibrate the tiny, tiny little point that they converge on, which means you can calibrate them to make somebody see the color blue or smell the scent of roses uh, or anything. 
Now, obviously, that could be used for some pretty horrendous things as well, like torture and this kind of thing, which is why, again, I'm part of the expert SI to preemptively legislate against that kind of misuse. But the main thing is that would mean you could wear something very, very small that would be able to send all the images that you need, including touch, smell, taste, sense, vision, to your brain, no glasses required. That may be the future, or maybe I'm getting a bit sci-fi. Uh, the last question was, is it going to converge in the sense that nobody has to work anymore and we're all in universal basic income? I'm a big, I'm a big lefty, right? Which is not unusual in Scotland. We're quite a socialist country, right? But even I know that there have been some <laughs> fairly, fairly bad uh, trial runs of, of 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 true socialism in the past, and I don't know how that's going to pan out. But it does seem likely. The positive of this, now let's take a dark historical precedent, but try to extract the positives of it and see how we can get the best of this. Look at the countries that seem to do really, really well. Okay, so the Middle East and Persopolis and so forth during the European Dark Ages, the uh, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Egyptians. What did they all have in common? Well, they were coming up with amazing things like mathematics and trigonometry and philosophy. They had slaves, slaves doing all the work for them, so they could sit at home and think about stuff and come up with really good ideas. Now, slavery is an absolutely horrendous thing. Which is still alive and kicking today, unfortunately. However, if we can use devices, non-conscious devices, to do that work for us, then we get all the benefits. And hopefully none of the horrendous ramifications of slavery. Maybe that will mean that we can continue to develop our minds and come up with cool stuff. The uh, the utopian vision of this is by actually another Scottish uh, writer, East Scottish writer and West Scottish, called Ian Banks, Ian M. Banks, culture novels, where he predicted a, a society called the, uh, the culture, where AI was largely doing all the hard work and people just got to do stuff, fun stuff, come up with ideas or whatever. And, uh, but to be honest with you, we may find that our ability to come up with ideas and creativity does end up being surpassed. That was always the thing that we thought would never be surpassed. And now we're starting to wonder. It doesn't mean to say there's no point in us existing. Just because there's a smart guy in the room doesn't mean to say that you don't get a, get a say or have an opinion, right? But um, it does mean to say that you could have something which could run things maybe better. I mean, look at our political and environmental policies. <laughs> Could be improved upon. So, um, you know, but anyway, we'll see. We'll see. Chris, you've got your hands up there. Yo, uh, for a lot of the uh, that labor, uh, the modern version of slavery is imported labor, low cost imported labor. Lo lots of places like Singapore and Saudi Arabia, the Im cheap imported labor outnumbers the local population by five or 10 to one. So that's going to keep on going. That's actually cheaper. I've seen studies than uh, going the high technology route. For your last uh, application there of um, advanced visualization of uh, massive data, uh, that's a fascinating one. DARPA, the which I've worked with, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has uh, about a dozen different kinds of glasses to enable people uh, in the same room to visualize uh, incoming data for like cyber war, where it's so massive and so fast that uh, just watching screens doesn't do it anymore. So they're looking at uh, false colors. They're uh, even using um, multiple uh, senses, including uh, sound and whatnot to, to visualize packets of uh, data and that's uh, fascinating to watch. I was uh, at a mining company there's a company in uh, Holland that does uh, animation for mining where you're flying uh, through the um, uh, the uh, uh, oil deposits and instead of seeing sheets of uh, blue you know blue line uh, sheets in 2D data, you're flying through the tunnels where the oil is, and you're seeing it in different colors uh, for the density of oil and whatnot. And we tested it out, and for several guys wearing HMDs in a room flying and talking, uh, they were getting two to three times the yield of oil 
that uh, they could by conventional means. And it was a really big deal because uh, they're doing a lot of slanted oil drilling now, not just straight down, but also in order to get below buildings and a bunch of things. So mm -hmm. for advanced visualization, that's a brilliant use of the kind of technology you were talking about. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because even in renewable energy, uh, you you require kind of different energy sources for different purposes. So for industrial, which uses the same amount of energy 24 hours a day, uh, you might use a different form of energy like wave power, that kind of thing, given that storage is quite difficult with the electricity thus far. Um, you might use solar for, for different things in Barbados, for instance, they've got access to wind, wave and solar, but they've got a domestic energy market, they've got an industrial energy market, and they've got a hospitality energy market, and each of which have different peaks and troughs throughout the day. But also you there's the getting the energy to the place. Now there's a company called uh, Aquaterra, based in Orkney, yeah, who have gone fully hydrogen economy, and they've got a system which can go, here is the red, amber, green solution for your location and your application in terms of what form of energy generation, renewable energy generation, is most appropriate for your requirements in that area. The problem is, the only people who can understand it are data scientists, and it's all a bunch of spreadsheets, right? And they said to me, when I was in Barbados with uh, Gareth Davies from that company, can you do this in virtual reality? Can we literally just go, uh, we have a factory there and it'll go ping, ping, ping. Uh, here's where you want to have your wind, your wave, your hydrogen development and storage and so forth. And here's the most efficient ways to do it. Very fast. Anyone can understand it. And uh, you get better yields that way. So it's all about stakeholder engagement. There's also the nimbyism aspect. I don't know if this is a term actually in the UK, but not in my backyard, nimby, uh, which is basically, I don't want a wind turbine there because it's going to spoil my view. But if you can show somebody in augmented reality, okay, look at your window. Can't see it. It's behind that forest. They'll be like, all right, okay, fine. You can go ahead. And that's a really fast way to engage a stakeholder. Yeah, again, DARPA, the guys I mentioned who actually created uh, the internet and GPS and a whole bunch of things, they, uh, they have $3 billion a year to spend on this kind of stuff. So for people looking for jobs in XR, that's a great, uh, uh, they, uh, the, the guys, the program managers do almost nothing. It's all contractors that do all this work, three billion worth. And I've, I've gotten contracts out of DARPA within weeks instead of years for like the military. But they're, so they're doing a lot of stuff uh, in this area for cyber war for, and what you just mentioned, rapid prototyping that is being able to see a, a, a tank or a, a, a thing before you build the actual prototype. Uh, some years back, the US Army built a thing called the Sergeant York for uh, a track vehicle to shoot down Soviet hind helicopters. And they built the thing for several billion dollars of rolling prototype um, until they uh, uh, discovered that the Soviet helicopter could blast could shoot the uh the sergeant york long before it came into range that could all have been done in uh, 3d visualizations in vr which is what darpa is doing now they have you know, programs in that of rapid prototypes where you have a simulated prototype and then you keep improving it and improving it that's an interesting case study because in manufacturing as well i think it was a bell uh, Aerosystems, uh, helicopter manufacturers, and they uh, it would take them many, many years to create a to design a helicopter because they would design it and then they would make effectively a clay model of the thing and then they would build a prototype and then they would put a pilot in it and the pilot would say, I can't see the ground. And they'd have to go back to the drawing board, right? But they just discovered, and this is about six years ago with the earlier kind of virtual reality headsets, that they could build a virtual model, stick the pilot in there, and they go, can't see the ground, can you make the window a bit bigger? And they would do it live on the spot until everybody's happy, and then they would build the thing. Now, even back then, that was taking the process of designing the thing from six years, at roughly a million a day, to six months. That is a big saving right there. <laughs> so, uh, and you end up with something that's far more fit for purpose rather than a, we're over budget, we're over time, let's just build the damn thing. And you end up with something which isn't perfect, right? 
Whereas in this case, things were more perfect. Arguably, one of the reasons that Tesla was such a pro prodigious or prolific um, inventor was that the way that his most likely autism manifested itself was that he could design and prototype things in his head and run them and see what was going wrong before he ever built a prototype, which is why also so much died with him because it was all in his head. <laughs> but, uh, the, or, you know, maybe it was all stolen by Edison if you believe the conspiracy <laughs> theories. But uh, the, the main thing was that if you can design and prototype things before you have to build them, it's massively less wasteful, it's massively more efficient, and it massively expedites the development process. So I can see exactly why DARPA would be doing what they're doing. Yeah, I think if um, there is a software, uh, for example, before I build Actuality Academy, I can put my concept and my thought and let the simulation run and see when, you know, when it will go viral or something. That would be awesome. And, and investor can also put, you know, oh, this company, I put URL and see, oh, when possibility, according to the all the information, when will this company profitable? And I think this will be a really good concept for the future. Yeah, you, you know the answer, right? Yeah. Fortune teller, yeah. Magic A, yeah. One of the things that uh, gets uh, left out, uh, most universities aren't teaching XR, VR. Their books, their textbooks are like four years out of date and so on. So to to you, you have to find other ways to learn and uh, to uh, look for jobs. And if one thing that usually gets left out is the that VR is fun. It's you know there's gamification. I'll give you a quick example. I helped uh, design a game for the fire department of New York. Uh, here was the problem: the uh, the teacher said for hazmat hazardous materials when you're getting into radioactivity or gas poisonous gases and whatnot. Uh, he said he had, it was the last class of the day, and he had to go uh, for the last row of students and jab them awake. They were learning how to, you know, keep the, uh, how to save their lives, and they were falling asleep because it was done with PowerPoints. So we did a game where they went through uh, simulated uh, exercises, like the New York subway with uh, green gas, chlorine released, and they went down, I was there for the first time, they went down there and uh, their bodies down, they're screaming at each other. The, uh, and in the middle of everything, the, the, the captain, the leader goes, God, he starts swearing a blue streak because he, they heard a train coming in. He forgot to, to call the station master, stop all the Metro trains as poisonous gas. So mm. the, the train was coming right into the uh, gas. So they were screaming. They were excited. And at the end of the uh, lesson, uh, the, uh, the, the teacher said normally he would jump out of the way of the door because the students would go streaming out of the classroom. Like uh, he called it like cockroaches when you turn in the kitchen, when you turn the lights on. <laughs> this is New York, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, for the first time ever, the entire class, without exception, came up to him um, and said, Lieutenant Tony, can we do it again? Ah, there we go. And that's learning. And when they get themselves in that situation, in reality, they'll know what to do. Yeah. Their, their brain will flick back to that experience. That's motivation. The it, they wanted to learn on their own time because mm -hmm. of motivation. There we go. And that's engagement. Great stuff. Uh, Hannah, I see that you've got your hand up there as well. Yeah. Uh, wait, I can put my camera on as well. Maybe that's a bit more. Yeah. There you are. Uh, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am, I'm, well, I was really interested in, in this talk, like in this, uh, or whatever we should call it. Um, and I'm actually super happy to hear about all this because I've been, uh, I'm going to graduate this week in creative technology, but I chose the direction of maker. So I'm working more with Arduino, but I did some 3D development and I really got into AR, XR, well, mostly AR um, in my internship uh, that I did. And um, and I was that was the thing that I that made me actually quite insecure that 
uh, even in my 3D courses and even the people who graduate at, at our school in 3D, um, only when they choose to do a VR project at the end, they will do something with VR. So I know someone who does something with AR. Otherwise, we have one course and that's it. In that one course of 3D development, we have to make a basic VR game. And I was already happy that we did something, but it actually made me quite insecure because now I was like, yeah, no, no. There's going to be so much people that know way more about it or know it way better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm actually quite happy to hear that it's also like I, I do know about game development. I have a base in that. Um, and I'm more about Arduino as well. So there's even possible combinations to do. Um, yeah, and I know it, with a lot of talks that I had like these past couple of days and weeks, um, it really gave me like more, um, I got a bit more secure about it. Like I can still learn a lot, but mm -hmm. there's also so much to do. And um, it's not because I only had one course, like it's not, um, yeah, like, uh, oh, you're you're 10 and you already need 25 years of experience or something. That's also not possible, I think, in the field yet. So <laughs> by the time you'd had that experience, what you'd learned would be obsolete. Yeah. Anyway, no, that's a very good point, Hannah. And <clears throat> here's the thing to remember when you graduate. Right? Uh, when I graduated originally, it was in, in marketing and, and consumer psychology. I learned more. I, I did four years of that and I arguably did pretty well at it. But um then I went and did uh, four weeks working with a shoestring theatre company and I learned about 10 times more in that four weeks than I'd learned in the previous four years. I remember when I learned to drive and it took me many, many hours of driving lessons to get to pass my test. Quite difficult in the UK to pass a test. And my stepfather said, right, now you're going to start learning how to drive. It will take you at least a year of being on the road before you really know how to drive, you know? Now, that is what is very much the case with this technology. Have the confidence to play. Playing is how you learn. Having a badge, having a magic piece of paper that says, I know this stuff is really, really useful for getting a job from people that don't really understand the technology, which is great because that gives you the opportunities to play, but you will never stop learning in this industry. And never allow somebody to make you feel like you're an amateur because they know more. Because like I was saying earlier on, every single day, my knowledge base is rendered 90% obsolete by the changes. As long as you keep learning, you're ahead of everyone else. So enjoy it, keep learning. And just in, you're doing this kind of product and technical design clearly because you're enthusiastic about it and you've got a passion for it. Let me give you a suggestion, um, which is free and worth every penny. Uh, schools have a, a very hard time really getting a project at the end where you get a hands-on, where you get hands-on experience. Uh, two places I found are one: the uh, most of the software is like uh, Unreal Engine have a user group. Join such a user group and get on board with somebody and ask to do some kind of grunt work, uh, you know, an unpaid intern. The advantage of that then is whatever project they do, you can then put that in your portfolio. And when you're job hunting, you go, oh, this is one of the projects I was involved in. You know, I'd have to spell out, you know, each thing that you did. The other thing you want to do is go to um, uh, so one of the conferences, uh, like the Game Developers Conference, and there go to companies and groups and whatnot and see if you can get some experience uh, as uh, like interning because then you will be so far ahead when you're uh, going uh, job hunting. The uh, uh, If the place like GDC can cost $1,500 or be expensive, if so, become a journalist I've done this many, many times, become a uh, journalist for your school paper, for your local paper, volunteer. Hey, I can do an article on the on the GDC or there's a military version of that called the IITSEC in Orlando. Um, and then uh, then you get in free. And you uh, meet all these people and then get on a team to get that hands on experience because it's almost impossible to get in schools 
And if uh, they're on an interesting project, there is that uh, project then uh, with a full video of it is in your portfolio. That's amazing advice that Chris has just given you. And even back in the day when I first started out in marketing, they always said, find a charity, find a not-for-profit, find somebody who can't afford your services and, and volunteer, because then you get to do projects and you're as good as your portfolio, right? But the other thing about being a journalist is press passes will get you everywhere <laughs> and you can get in at the people that you would never get otherwise. So that's brilliant advice. I'd forgotten that. I used to do that early in my career as well. <laughs> you start doing that again. And like you, you learn a lot by being sitting in a room while they're developing. I'll give you one quick example. While we were developing a uh, training game for firefighters, and uh, firefighting is very, very dangerous, but there was a, a thing where uh, with heat, uh, glass breaks, like a window breaks, and the animators were going, oh, Jesus, this modeling how a window breaks is uh, expensive. This is going to take us forever to do. And the audio guy sitting there went, hey, I can make a perfect replica of the sound of glass breaking and then just have the glass and then it's black as the, all the glass is broken. And we checked with the uh, customer, is it, that's fine. So in five minutes, we managed to do what uh, uh, would have taken a month if we hadn't had that sharing of knowledge. Oh, speaking of sharing of knowledge, and you're totally right, if you provide the right noise, then people's brains provide the rest. It's the same with haptics. If you provide a little bit of input, like I remember I was bending a, a plastic stick using a pair of haptic gloves. I could feel the resistance on the plastic ruler, even though it was just the gloves. They weren't controlling my arms mm -hmm. or my upper body. So where was that feedback coming from? It was coming from here. It was provided to fill in the gaps. And by providing the right noise and a, a modicum of the animation, your brain will provide the rest. But the other thing I was going to say was, there, if something doesn't exist, you know, just sorry, if you don't have a thing, don't try and build it from scratch. First of all, find, look and see whether somebody else has come up with it because there's a very good chance there's a big world out there and there's a lot of people developing stuff. The chances are somebody's developed it. And that by reaching out to them, you're giving them a role. They'll find roles for you. You'll end up developing a network and you'll get all the best stuff. So don't try to reinvent wheels. But you've got knowledge of Arduino. You've got knowledge of IoT. That's quite rare. That gives you an extremely, when you're dealing with people that only deal in the, in the digital, you have the ability to take that into the physical world, massively valuable, and helps make what they do more valuable. So you're going to be able to get into a lot of rooms that other people wouldn't be able to because you've got so much intrinsic and unique value. So leverage it, yeah? Find out what they don't do and leverage what you can do. Yeah, and uh, working working with groups or getting inside of groups, as I said, you will learn more uh, in, in a few days than than a year in school. Uh, I mentioned uh, going to conferences. That's one. Getting into user groups for Unity, for Unreal, and whatnot is another. In uh, London, I discovered uh, one other way. Uh, London, I don't need one time because of tax preferences and whatnot. Ireland is even better than London, by the way. 37% mm -hmm. rebate on work you do there, like uh, animation and VR. But uh, anyway, the, the the companies like Disney try to keep everything very secret. You cannot walk into Disney and walk out with any knowledge. It's very secret. However, all those, uh, uh, v all those animators, all those XR experts, they tend to go to the same bar or pub after work. And in London, I discovered that there were four pubs where I could, uh, within five minutes, discover who was working on what project and over a couple of pints of, um, of uh, beer, learn anything I wanted to. They were helping each other. They were training off, hey, how are you guys doing, uh, uh, say, simulation of blood? You know, 3D semi blood is very hard to model. Or how are you doing underwater? So how are you doing this and that? They were trading off knowledge there. It was incredible The uh, for an ROI for a couple of pints of uh, beer that you buy them. It was incredible. So <laughs> a, uh, uh, London pubs, they're all in the same neighborhood or most, most of the big production 
places like Toronto and Los Angeles have a couple of bars everybody hangs out in. Uh, you that's a great way to break into to get into the working groups and find out what's going on. Chris, I'm going to uh, triangulate the need. This is the most central pubs to all of the developer zones and all of the cities. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's amazing how uh, loose life after a couple of years as well. That's great advice. I love. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of GBL game based learning, it's PBL pub based learning. Please <laughs> learning. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Chris mentioned a really good conference like a game development uh, a GDC, right? I, I went there for five days and I can tell you what I observed. Um, right now, because of you see like a recession, COVID recession, and a lot of uh, it's just this year and a lot of like a um, uh, kind of like a bank bankruptcy. And so it kind of involved effect the startup VC funding. So this year is extremely hard to get a job for big company. They are laying off people, the senior one. And for small company, because of recession and VC funding, the bank uh, uh, interest rate uh, interest rate rates. So uh, it's extremely hard for startup to, you know, to get new people and besides a AI automation. So um, this year is extremely hard. So when I was at GDC, I saw like the first floor, I would say probably down, downstairs, it's a giant exhibition hall. For the exhibition hall, it has a lot of different game companies, right? And what I observe for the exhibition hall is that there are a lot of individual students. They create their own small game studio. Because of AI, right? I can see one person create a game within short amount of time. For example, AI can create music and like AI can create voiceover. Uh, a lot of them are very affordable to create. Uh, yeah. So so I can see and a lot of students even partner and create LLC before they graduate. So I can see individual one person run an entire company and possibly charge a little lower than the professional one, but the quality is actually pretty good. So I can see this like from big company, uh, break it down to individual um, uh, kind of entities. One person uh, just graduated from college, 23 years old, and have a small LLC and start running a game company. And because of all the software, everything becomes much easier. And it's very easy to create something very decent. So that's first. And second is that if you go to the second floor, it's a, a speed dating for jobs. All the game development, uh, game design school students bring their physical portfolios. Right. It's like very professional. It's like they dress up, suit and tie. And when I went upstairs, I was shocked. It's just like 500 or 1,000 students gathered together from all over the world, United States. Everybody is trying to get a job and bring a resume. And it seems like the entire hall can, uh, the capacity is like 500 seats. So every five minutes, everybody will switch, rotate. So uh, we can kind of maximize the people that we talk. And uh, it has recruiter part and the student part. But it seems like one, one time that I went there for one hour, there, there were only two recruiters, a thousand students, more than a thousand. Like not only people inside the room, but also a lot of students are lining up and trying to uh, prepare to do the interview. And at the end, it becomes a student pitch or uh, interview each other. So, and those two, two companies who claim they are going to hire the recruiters, at the end, they didn't even want to hire anybody. And uh, when I was there, I talked to a lot of people. I find out they are so talented. Somebody who can play violin at a young age and can create a, an entire story, can do the 3D model, can code, Everything is like one person agency, but uh, trying to land on um, the minimum wage or even volunteer. So let's, so, so, the, uh, so I was wondering if maybe the job seeking need to switch the structure. Maybe we, 
maybe if you want to get paid, maybe slowly doing that, but also maybe run your own thing. For example, like you can have, since everything is so affordable, yeah. So maybe one person agency, one person game design studio, that's probably will be a norm. For example, maybe in the future, it will be a lot of like chat GPT robot work for you. So yeah, so yeah, I, I, I don't know about jobs, like a lot of like at my age, right? I'm all millennials. We were have we have a step by step like a graduate from college, get a job working uh, out towards the top to the dream company and be there for twenty years and retire. But this is kind of like a speed up era that I I feel like just like David that every day I'm renew myself. I can tell you last week I was learning um um like a mobile AR and this week I'm doing the the AR stuff for Oculus. And uh, yesterday, I think I switched to MRTK. So it's like every day, new documentary you need to read and every day things switch. And I, I change a lot every day, every hour. So um, if for you- For jobs, the one thing you've got to have is an elevator speech. So first get into some as a, as a uh, intern, or what not get into some group even if you're not officially employed get into a group that's doing things so that you have something colorful to present you know oh look here on my tablet this is the thing that i help produce uh, and and say that in the time it takes the elevator to go up five stories that'll get you a lot there's a great new book on job hunting that <laughs> this came out two days ago uh, you may see the author at the bottom. <laughs> I'll send. I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you a copy, Dom, Dominic. Uh, I can even autograph it for you. But uh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but it talks about how to get around the HR departments, the problems with uh, sending out resumes by the by the bucket load no one reads resumes it's all done by old versions of ai software that may not even recognize the kind of expertise you've got right now so at, as an example at conferences besides having a an elevator speech you know something emotional that you can uh, say in two minutes uh, besides having an elevator speech uh, you want to uh, watch where the, the guys, generally the higher ups, are not at the booths. They're off in, in, uh, you know, in, the, um, in the big rooms giving uh, uh, talks or being on panels. So make sure you sit in the front row always. And before or after, before the panel starts or after it ends, um, uh, rush up to the person you want to see. Have a business card, uh, or, you know, in a way to, they won't have them, but get some way of getting their information. Have a business card, because that looks good. They, they'll lose it, but it looks good. And then ask the question, which of your, I'd like to follow up with you, which of your assistants should I be talking to? They are going to be too busy to talk with you. That ain't going to happen. But if you get an assistant, so for instance, I would pitch a four-star general in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'd go, which of your assistants? And he'd give me the name of a two-star or a three-star general. I would then call him up and hi, go, hi, General so-and-so told me to contact you. <laughs> and now this guy goes, oh, if it's the big guy who ordered this, I've got to be responsive. So you can then follow up with the assistant, go visit them, do a thing that, and uh, that'll get you uh, into doors that uh, you would not normally get into. So at a conference, rush up to the big guy and go, what's the name of your assistant that I can talk to? That's brilliant advice. Uh, <clears throat> one other bit that I would add to this, and also I want to answer a... Uh, Let's see whose was it? Winton's uh, uh, question as well about entrepreneurialism, because that's kind of the route that I went in my professional career was, you know, 
self-employment until I started partnering with other people. But to uh, add to that is if you're handing out a business card, design your business card so it has a small gap that will fit a puffy sticker. Do you know what I mean by a puffy sticker? The ones that you buy in like, you know, card shops or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you can make one of those fit on the middle or this corner of your, your, your card, then it can't go anywhere but the top of the pile of cards. So that's yeah. the card. <laughs> and put a QR code on it, by the way. I absolutely. Or a puffy QR code. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> we have the perfect solution now. Go to a pub and hand out puffy QR codes and you'll be a millionaire. So next question was um, the... Uh, Winton had asked, do you recommend uh, going entrepreneurial and starting a micro business if you, given the job market at the moment, right? Okay, first of all, the world is bigger than the city you're in, okay? If you're in Dublin, there is no job shortage. If you're in London, there is no job shortage, okay? There's tons of work in different countries. If you're in uh, Dubai, tons of work, right? There's, in San Francisco, yes more 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 talent than there are jobs currently but that'll pass so you just look to where the jobs are you don't need to physically go there you can do a lot of this stuff digitally so don't worry about the job market there's always a job market somewhere you just need to find it and don't be parochial in your thinking there there's places outside of your back door that you can go to right none of my clients are in scotland not one of them they're all in other countries australia across africa across bits of North America and Canada, none of them are where I live. If I looked where I live, I would be starving to death right now. You know, look outside your back door. Next, working as an entrepreneur, coming up with a micro business, yes, but don't start with an idea that you came up with in your head and you thought was cool and then try and find a market for it. That is exactly the wrong way to do it, okay? Go the marketer route, find the demand, find the problem which has not been solved then build the solution. Otherwise, what you're doing is wandering rooms with a round peg trying to hammer it into a square hole. What you do is you find the hole and then you make the peg to fit it. That is going to get you solutions. And you can only learn that by talking to your customers, right? That's what Chris was talking about there. Meet the people who have got the challenges. They're very rarely technical people, but they'll tell you what they need. And if you can say to them at a week or a month afterwards, I've got a solution to that problem of yours. They'll bite your hand off to get it. So that is the reason I haven't starved to death is I always approach, use that approach. I also use the approach of if I don't have to invent it or build it from scratch, I won't. The only things I ever built from scratch, almost from scratch, was that virtual reality classroom thing because nobody had built one that was that wasn't app based and wasn't really just developed by text for text and wasn't really suitable because every time they updated it it stopped working on half of the devices and that kind of thing and no matter how many times i shouted at the people that ran the companies they wouldn't make it fit for purpose so we had to go away and build something that was web based that's the only time i've ever done that every other time i've looked to find somebody who's got a thing and i've connected them with the person who wants the thing and I've made money uh, helping them and helping the other person. So win-win. And every time you do it, you learn something new. And that means that when you get into that elevator pitch situation, you get into the elevator, you find out what they need, and then you tell them the solution that you've got that fits that need. Because otherwise, nine times out of 10, the thing that you've got in your elevator pitch is no use to them because it's not relevant. If you ask them the question first, what do you need? then you can, as you mature in your business and you get more experience, always have an answer, always have a solution for their need. So that would be where I would go for the entrepreneurial side of things. But then Dominic said, pay your bills first. <laughs> and she is 100% right there. You know, when you're in a plane, they say, put on your own mask before you help your child or dependent. That's because if you've asphyxiated, you're no use to that child. If you've been evicted from your house and you can't eat, you're not going to be able to develop a business, right? you got to look after your basic needs first. The uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says uh, survival needs first, food, shelter, water, and then you start moving into other things, and that still stands. And if that means you got to work in McDonald's for a bit, so be it. I've worked in call centres whilst running other businesses. When I started as a lecturer, I was starting two businesses at the same time. 
okay, I gave myself nervous exhaustion and a, and a mental breakdown at the end of that year, but sometimes you've got to do that to keep the wolf from the door until you can get things going. I just want to mention one thing. I posted a link in the chat uh, for Hannah about tiny ML. I'm, I'm a computer vision researcher and DARPA funded my graduate research, for example. And, <laughs> hey. and, uh, and, uh, one this of the mom, things- <laughs> One of the things that I've found interesting lately was this tiny machine learning movement. And you can literally, for $20, uh, buy a computer the size of a postage stamp. And there's a little camera module that you can attach to it. And it's sort of amazing the computer vision uh, functions that you can perform with that tiny, tiny computer. It does a lot of other things as well. It can process audio. It can process uh, vibration and motion. Uh, for example, somebody had a project where they put one in a shipping container and it could record everything that happened to their package through the shipping process when it was on the ocean, when it was on uh, a, like a, a transport truck, uh, whether it was handled roughly or not. Uh, so there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with this tiny machine learning, which is just an incredible field that has suddenly opened up. So since you're maker oriented, you could do little projects on something like that, and they could end up being very interesting. And also, Good. I want to share is that uh, I think share on social media, such as LinkedIn, because if you share on Facebook, it's all your mom, your family look at that. And my family is very distant from me because uh, my, my, my family is an extremely conservative family. My, my mom worked for, for a school for over 40 years, and my younger sister is uh, working for government. So that's kind of my, 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 my family. And my mom doesn't even want to try VR headset because she's afraid of some weird thing will happen. <laughs> so, so that's my family is totally different from me. So uh, I find out that um, if you create kind of like, it's kind of a marketing test and also uh, train your skills. Uh, I, 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 I read some successful kind of like a, a TikTok very big famous business people in China. And the, the woman, she said that she create, she spent six hours per day to read, learn, and create content. Uh, and after seven years, it, it, it's not like a, at the beginning she did uh, TikTok, but uh, she has been doing all the uh, kind of like consulting for business for 16 years. And the last one year, last year, she started creating a lot of like uh, TikTok videos. Uh, and then she suddenly becomes like a few billion views. Um, a lot of followers become one of the top like a business consultant. Uh, I want to share is that I think using LinkedIn, something that I told myself, I want to post at least one post every day. And then I have a friend, like recently we had a meeting and he told me that, wow, Dom, you, you are everywhere. Every day when mm -hmm. I open my LinkedIn, you are there. Same, same as David. David, every day I, I look up LinkedIn and David posts a lot of cool stuff. So it, it, it's like, um, so it, it's, it's kind of awareness and also kind of forced me to come up, to, to dig in myself and produce some new stuff. Uh, to to uh, give to people and also this is a good marketing strategy for example like right now I told myself I need to create AR best practice for Vision Pro or using see, seeing some interesting um, creations or interesting interactions and do the prototype and every day I'm going to post one and that is a big challenging and it's kind of like and and every time when I post something I see, oh, there's not many people interact. But when I post something, oh, there are a lot of people interact. So I'm going to do the, the, the one that has a lot of numbers. So maybe that's another way to force yourself to present in front of other people. I know a lot of people has like anxiety of posting, but I told them that just treat that like, uh, you know, you're a notepad or you're 
diary or, or your journey. And later on, if you forget, oh, you know, I saw something interesting and I always dive in back in my LinkedIn feed and see wow, my repost. And then I treat it as kind of document. Yeah, so I think that that is also a good way to, to keep growing and keep marketing yourself. I think that's really good advice, <clears throat> Dominic, because also you don't need to come up with content, your, your own content. People don't want you to be constantly promoting yourself. Find other people that do relevant stuff to the kind of folk that you want to know about you and share other people's content with them. Always credit them. Always make sure that they know where the source was because then people won't resent you sharing their stuff. They'll thank you for it. But the weird thing is if you're the mouthpiece, if you're the person that they heard it from, that the audience heard it from, they associate you with being the, uh, the thought leader, the industry leader, the go-to person. If you're the go-to person, then there's always a role for you. That's worked really nicely for me. I find 90% of the stuff that I share has got nothing to do with stuff that I built. It's cool stuff that I find that other people have built that I put out there and everybody goes, it's amazing. And I always I will say, this was this person, you can find them here. Nine times out of 10, the person responding to the post says, I really like that thing that you did, David. Can you do that for me? And I'm like, you're not reading the post. But it actually works out really nicely because you're the person that's associated with being the specialist and you're learning at the same time and you're building friends and contacts at the same time. And it takes 10 minutes a day. It's the best form of marketing I've ever encountered. Cool. Any other questions? And um, yeah, anyone want to share anything? OK, cool. Yeah, thank you so I'll much. I'll do a quickie, Adam. Uh, just to underline what David just said, when you get into a group, whether it's a user group or whatever, when you get in a group and that's doing a project, uh, then you can uh, uh, create a story, a short story about how we, we did that project. <laughs> we created this thing and we had a problem that was such and such and we solved it by how. Uh, do all that in two minutes. And then you are associated with uh, a, a great uh, project that was produced and you are now a problem solver. And because you told a story about it, it shows how great you are without you ever saying the words, oh, I am great. Yeah. It came out in the story. Become a storyteller, but keep them short. That's, That's good. It. Good, good advice again. Winston, you've got a, a question. Do you want to? Oh, I just want to say thank you and uh, nice to meet everybody. And I appreciate the presentation. Learned a lot. And uh, thank you for sharing your perspectives and your expertise. It's been great. I really appreciate it. So happy to have helped. And it's so grateful to everybody else for all of the incredible advice that they've been given. I've been taking notes, by the way, <laughs> from all of you guys. That's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah. We, we keep on learning, David. Uh, do you know there are three ways to grow new brain cells? 20 years ago, we didn't know that you could grow new brain cells, but uh, uh, now we do. There are three ways to do it. One is by exercise. That does a little, not very much, but it does exercise good for everything. The second is blueberries. Blueberries, I, I sat on the plane next to the guy studying this, and I listened for for four hours uh, as we uh, as he went through his research. It was incredible. So blueberries create new brain cells, but what does it most of all is learning something new, new knowledge, and they've tested this as uh, especially the hypothalamus uh, area which is for mood and, and, and decision-making and whatnot, learning something new and just being excited about it will grow new brain cells. The opposite of not growing new brain cells is they die out and you get depression. Mm. So and you, learn you new stuff young. like this. Learning new stuff, it keeps you young. I'm going to be 50 next year. And it's wow. it, it just it keeps you young, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, literally, literally. Yeah, I'm 37. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people always think I'm like a 23 something. <laughs> yeah, no, you look like you're in your 20s. 
with wisdom beyond your years. I see that uh, somebody else asked a question in the chat. Let me just see. Uh, Sharos. Oh, no, wait a minute. Shat. Sharos, sorry, I'm terrible with the pronunciations. From Pakistan, I'm a web XR developer in Unity 3D. I'm facing some problems with colorblind older people adaptation. There's an interesting one. There's research on that. There's research on everything. <laughs> I wrote some research on the uh, depth perception issues of people with senile dementia and how uh, um, virtual reality can help with that. But uh, for colorblind and older people adaptation, I can actually hit me up a link and I'll send, send you some of the research that I've done. But you can bet there's been research specifically on colorblindness. I know that those glasses, I don't know how they work, but you see these really heartwarming videos on YouTube of people trying on these glasses and being able to see colors for the first time and almost invariably bursting out crying because it's so impactful for them. So I bet you there's really good research on that one. Unless anybody knows specifically in the in the crowd about this right now. No, nope. okay. So yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll send you some info. Um, right. Uh, okay. By the way, Dom, we were at ten there, so we only lost three people throughout the whole thing, and we're like <laughs> an hour and a half over over time. So I'm feeling oh, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to follow uh, David and maybe ping David and ask more about the details. And David is definitely like a super knowledgeable. Yeah, so yeah, and make sure follow David because every day when you look up uh, LinkedIn, you will learn something new from David. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. And hopefully see you guys uh, next time. Bye-bye. Lovely to meet you all. Thanks for having me, Tom. Bye-bye.